Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, my dear sisters and my brothers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. This is your brother Abdus Salam. In this talk, I am going to speak about the practice of janaza rituals that we, the believers, Muslims, do. Its roots, the history, and its validity when it comes to the Quran. The question which triggered this talk is the following. Ustad, Assalamu alaikum. I have a question about the significance of washing a dead body, perfuming it, etc. until the final step of burying it. Is there anything in the Quran speaking about it? So this is the question. This talk or this answer in particular is what I call or I refer to as an in-between talk. An in-between talk is a talk that I deliver based on a question or sometimes a comment or something that somebody says or asks or whatever. While I am preparing a bigger talk, for example, like now I am preparing a talk about the height, the menstruation of women. When a woman has her menses, is it true that she should not uh, pray, she must not fast, she must not do this, she must not do that? Is this religious or something else lurks behind this issue? So that is the topic. A hundred pages I am on, on this research paper. And this talk or this question about Janaza kicks in. And then I find myself wanting to answer this. In an ideal world, really in an ideal world where every Muslim out there is prioritizing Al-Quran, believes what Allah says, and that's that. I would have said, oh, Allah said this in Al-Quran, Allah said that in the Quran, And of it, I give you the reference of where that is, and that's it. My responsibility has been done. I pointed you out to what Allah said and where. You go there, you read it, and you deal with it. This is the ideal world. This is how Allah wanted his Islam. He wanted him, the Quran, to us. We interpret the Quran, we act upon it. And then on judgment day, when we are held responsible for our deeds, The only reference, really, that goes on that day is, why did you this, do this? And our answer should always be, Ya Allah, because you said, end of it. But sadly, we're not in an ideal world. Al-Quran is challenged, is burdened. Hardly ever you hear somebody giving you a full talk only based on what Allah says, without involving or calling upon a hadith narrative or a statement of another person or scholar so and so forth. As if Allah's words are not sufficient to drive al-Islam. This might seem strange to you, but it is a fact that our sheikhs, scholars, and it's been taught to us, and I used to preach this before, that the Quran itself cannot drive Islam. That is an extremely wrong statement. But... It occurs. So in an ideal world, a simple answer would have said, one, two, three, finish. But we're not an ideal world, and this is why I have to make these introductions, and I have to talk this, and I have to do that. For me, or for my words to have any significance and any weight in the world of where we are today, I need to have the Quran backing me up. Anything that I say must be backed up by the Quran. If my words come from me or just like that, then they have absolutely no meaning whatsoever. Why? It's simple really. Because on judgment day, when we stand up in front of, we're not going to face Allah face to face. But when I say stand up, I even going to be held accountable for our deeds. We're going to be questioned. By, and it is Allah, Him, who is going to speak to us. How? Really simple. Like he spoke to Moses in the wilderness of the desert. Musa didn't see Allah, didn't, but he heard Allah speak in a manner that befits Allah. What kind of voice? Is it high, low, middle, timber, whatever it is? That's beside the point. We're not there, we didn't hear it, we cannot explain it, explain it or express it. But what we know is, if Allah did speak to Musa, And if Allah spoke to Adam, and if Allah spoke to a shaitan behind the veil, it never was a face to face. It was they heard him. And of course Allah hears us. And that was that. 
our accountability day will be just like that. We will be held responsible. We're going to hear Allah talk, but we're not going to see Allah. And this goes extremely against everything Salafis say. They say, well, on the judgment day, we are going to see Allah. And the Quran says, no, you're not. The Hadith says, yes, you are. And who do you think <laughs> won the argument? In an ideal world, nothing stands in front of the Quran. But we are not in an ideal world, and that is why everything stands before the Quran. It's sad, but that's what's happening. So, on Judgment Day, when Allah is going to hold us responsible, the only book, the only law that He is going to hold me and you, the believers, in the Quran, is the Quran. Those who believe in the Torah, Allah will hold them responsible and accountable to what is inside the Torah. Those who believe in Jesus and the Bible and whatever, Allah will hold them accountable to what law they followed. I am not going to be held accountable to a law that is in the Torah. Just like the Jews of today who do not believe in the Quran aren't going to be held accountable to something that is in the Quran. And this is why Allah pointed us in one direction. That direction is clear. You can ask me, if it is this clear, how come the man of religion didn't follow it? And I will tell you it's simple. Because through their entire life, the man of the religion, the shaykh, the scholars, whoever it is, they have not made the Quran their primary source of information. They added so many layers to them. And because of that, and as Allah has made it clear in the Quran, anyone who prioritizes anything other than the Quran will be made to forget the Quran. Hey, you're not using it. Why you, you remember it? Look at this ayah, what Allah says, yeah? And it's very clear. اخْتَلَفْتُمْ فِيهِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ This, uh, what I'm going to read now, is in Surah Ashura. The surah number 42. Ashura is when a bunch of group of people get together and they talk and they brainstorm of a, about an issue just to come up with an answer. Alrighty? So it's kind of like the council. The surah is 42 and the ayah is 10. Allah explicitly says, fihi min shay'in. And whatever matter, i.e. anything you disagree about, you differ over, or disagree on, what do we do with it? We go to the hadith, we go to the sheikhs, we go to... No. Allah says, فَحُكْمُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ It's judgment, the ruling upon that thing there, rests with Allah. Allah is telling us anything we disagree on, the first and only source of reference that to go to, to get our answer, is what Allah says. And how Allah spoke to us? In the Quran. It's incredible. The ayah is there. No, someone might say, yes, the Quran is there, but it doesn't have all the answers. And I say, no, that is an extremely wrong statement. The clarification and explanation of the Quran was not left to the messenger. The messenger of Allah, Muhammad, didn't hold the daily or weekly uh, teaching classes in his masjid. No, like we do today, weekly course, weekly class, weekly talk to explain this and that. At the time of the messenger, if the messenger had a say in Allah's religion, if it was up to the messenger to explain religion to people, to what Allah says, he would have held talks every week at three o'clock, come to a talk. And because he is a messenger and people have different schedules, he would have to hold that talk on a daily basis. But he didn't. The messenger never, ever held teaching classes in his life. It was not his job to explain the Quran to people. Quran was in Arabic, in a language that the people understood. The messenger acted like the microphone, like the amplifier. He just amplified what Allah said. And people understood what Allah said. Now that you understood what Allah said, go and act on it. And that is why Allah stated in the Quran that the explanation, the clarification of what Allah wants is inside the Quran. Tafsil al kitab la rayba fih. The detailed explanation of the book, i.e., the Quran, is without any doubt. Min Rabbil Alamin, from the Lord of the words, and that is Allah. I repeat this ayah, it's extremely clear. 
the detailed explanation of the Quran is without any doubt from the Lord of the worlds. Just like when we read the Fatiha, we say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. And they tell us, we praise Allah who is the Lord of all worlds. Anything that is a world that exists today, pretty much everything, Allah is its Lord. Guess what? This ayah alone should have been enough for the sheikhs, the scholars, to understand that anything that needs an explanation is inside the Quran. And if we defer or disagree on anything, we should return it to the Quran. Why? Because everything is explained by Allah. We would never ever have had these problems that we are in today. But no, Al Quran alone was never ever allowed to drive Islam. Of course, except in the life of the messenger. And we see how the messenger had managed to uh, bring people together. Why? Because he called them all to one source, the Quran. The moment the messenger died, everything went loose. And this is why my deceases and my brothers, Prophet Muhammad, the messenger Muhammad, just like Musa, like any other messenger, were sent to as messengers as the name indicates messengers they carry a message from somebody who is Allah to somebody else who is the humans Allah is one he uses one single human being to deliver a message to other human beings and then the other human beings were supposed to deliver this same message to other human beings and so on and so forth and this is why Allah states to Muhammad and we have descended the book, i.e. the Quran, the law, upon you. As a clarification to everything. The Quran is a clarification to every single thing. So why we have thousands of hadiths? If the Quran is a clarification, and this is in Surah An-Nahl 16, the gifts of Allah, they translate An-Nahl as the bees. No, An-Nahl in Arabic means to give somebody something, a special gift. But you know, so that's Surah number 16, and the ayah is 89. This ayah mentions that the Quran is a clarification. It details everything we need. So we're supposed to, whatever we do that is part of Islam, must have been detailed in great details in the Quran, <laughs> including Janaza. If Janaza or should Janaza be part of Islam, it must have been detailed in Al Quran step by step. Allah did detail so many things in the Quran less important than Janaza. He even detailed in the Quran when kids can enter a private room of the parents the three times of the day when they cannot of course without uh, double checking and knocking on the door and things like that and you would think the Quran would talk about janaza which is far more important than talking about when a child can enter the private room the, the bedroom of his parents but hey the ayah this ayah I just mentioned right now is, is, is still heavily distorted by the sheikhs they tell you, yes, the Qur'an is a clarification to everything. How did we learn how to pray? How do, know, how do we know what, how many number of rakat in Maghrib 3, 2, and 4, 4, 4? How, how, how? The Qur'an doesn't have these numbers. And I tell you, have you ever thought of this issue differently? Why do we have in our salat two rakat loud and two rakat silent? Fajr is two rakat loud. Maghrib, the first two are loud. Aisha, the first two are loud. And then everything is quiet. Dhuhr is completely quiet. Asr, the four of them are quiet. Maghrib, the third one is quiet. And Aisha, the last two are quiet. You ever ask yourself, if the Salat was one Salat to Allah, who had divided this Salat into two parts? The first two rak'at are loud and the second two rak'at are quiet. Well, it's simple really. Because the real salat is only two rakat. Is what you any salat in your daily day that you recite loudly, i.e., fajr the two, maghrib the first two, isha the first two. These are the salat that Allah had written in the book. Anything that is quiet, 
after these two is humanly added salat. Simple. But people use the wrong practice of humans to establish the authenticity of the Quran even though the Quran has spoken countless times about its authenticity, about it, him being the sole driver of Al-Islam. And this is why Allah made it clear in the Quran that the job description of the messengers that Allah sent since Nuh to Muhammad is two things. The messengers are to do two things. وَمَا نُرْسِلُ الْمُرْسَلِينَ And we do not send the messengers إِلَّا مُبَشِّرِينَ وَمُذِرِينَ Except as deliverers of good news and warners of the bad news. That's it. They, a messenger has just the job description to bring good news to people. How does he bring the good news? What is mentioned in his book? And how does he warn people against bad practices from what is in the Quran or whatever book Allah, Allah has descended? So the job description mentioned by Allah in the Quran over and over and over and over is a messenger is there to bring good news to people and warn them against against bad ending. Hey. And since it is Allah who has descended the Quran, the law on the messenger, the job of the messenger is to relay. Put it this way. If we have two presidents, let's say an English-speaking president and a non-English-speaking president, let's say China is going to meet England. This speaks English, the other one speaks Chinese, but none of them speaks the language of the other. What do they have in between them? They have a messenger, the translator. The translator listens to the English, translates it into Chinese. And then they understand the general meaning, and later on when they sit, they ensure that the translation is adequate. A messenger translates what Allah wants in the human language. Because if I received an angel to deliver to me the message of Allah, on judgment today we can have all sorts of excuses. It's an angel. He, I didn't understand the angelic, but when it's a human being, then I understand. And this is why also Allah ensured that each and every messenger that Allah sends to a people must be a native from those people. Let's say, Allah has stated in the Quran, in Surah Ibrahim, that whenever He sends a messenger, messenger, and whenever we were to send a messenger, we send him with the tongue of his own people. Why? So that he expresses to them what Allah has descended. So, Muhammad is an Arab. He was sent to the Arabs. He spoke their language. They understood him. And this is why Allah speaks to Muhammad saying, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرِ And we have descended the dhikr, i.e. the reminding the message of the Quran to you. لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ So you broadcast to people what was descended to them. The sheikhs distorted the meaning of this ayah and made it mean, and we have sent down the Quran to you, the reminder, so that you explain it to people. To bayin, to bayin meaning they explain, you explain it. And that is not what it means. All it means is Allah sent down the Quran to Muhammad so that Muhammad can broadcast it to the people that was descended to them. At the end of the day, the Quran was not descended to Muhammad. The Quran was descended to us. The means was Muhammad. And Muhammad himself was asked and ordered by Allah to follow the Quran that was descended to the other people. The Messenger of Allah very well understood this reality. So what happened is, Towards the end of his life, Allah ordered Muhammad, the messenger, to deliver a chilling message to his followers. قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ Say and declare to the people who are with you, this is my way, this is my mission. What is your messenger, mission, your messenger of Allah? I invite to Allah, not to him. 
Not to his uh, school of thought, nothing. He invites to Allah. How do you invite to Allah? You invite to the Quran. And this is then, he says, Ala basiratin, upon clearance, i.e., as in things are clear, the insights. And those insights are the ayat of the Quran. Basira is the singular form of basair. Basair are the evidences, the compelling evidences. And Allah has referred to the ayat of the Quran, to the text of the Quran, few times as being basair, compelling evidences. I'll just mention one of them in the Surah 12, the Ayah 104, where Allah says, قَدْ جَاءَكُمْ بَصَائِرٌ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ Clarifying insights, i.e. the ayat of the Qur'an, have indeed come to you from your Lord. فَمَنْ أَبْصَرَ فَلِنَفْسِهِ So whoever sees and follows these teachings in the Qur'an, those insights, will do so to the benefit of himself or oneself. وَمَنْ عَمِيَ And whoever blinds their upon and doesn't follow them, does so to his own loss. The Qur'an is clear. Really, and this is why when the sheikhs today in the 21st century, in 2023, when they preach Islam, hardly ever you hear them mention the Quran because the moment they mention the Quran, they need to change its meaning or mention an ayah out of its context or things like that, and we end up with all kinds of problems. The messenger understood very well that his mission is to call to Allah through what? By calling people to the Quran. Is this only for him? No, it's for him and to anyone who comes after him. And this is why he said, Anna, i.e. I, and whoever follows me. Wa subhanallah, and glory and holy be Allah. Wa ma ana, in the Arabic word, the, the way they put the vowels on the letters is very disturbing. Some words, really, when you dig deep into them, they lose of their meanings. Like this one here. وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ And it says, oh, and I am not an associator. How can, the Prophet cannot say this. He's already a messenger sent by Allah. He cannot say, oh, I am not a mushrik. People know this. The Quran he speaks says this. But the true Meaning of the ayah is وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرَاكِينَ And I am not to be associated with the religion of Allah. Just there. Just like that. Allah orders the messenger to relate to us and speak out what the Quran says, what Allah says in the Quran. The Prophet speaking to people doesn't explain it. And this is extremely important. The Prophet reads the Quran does not explain it. But the sheikhs, they lied to us and they say, oh, no, the, these people. No, the Quran was not sent to the idiots. It was sent to people who understood. They had faculties, they had brains, they had intellect. And Allah has mentioned this in the Quran countless times. Maybe you would ponder upon, maybe you would think about it, maybe you'd be observant. Allah was not talking to idiots. Because no matter what kind of a person you are, whatever your education level is, you understand language. If I tell you do not drink, do not kill, do not fornicate, do not lie, do not cheat, you do not need a PhD to understand do not cheat and do not lie. A kid, a toddler, you can teach him not to lie. So the Quran is not to be th thought of as you need a special degree of education to understand it because that defeats the message that defeats the purpose of the descent of the Quran altogether and because Allah knows humans we are different some of us will uh, do this more than that and will prioritize this more than that that's fine but Allah knows as well that in human beings there are those who will want to follow in the footsteps of the messages. They want to do the job of the messengers. Yes, things get lost in the translation. People will forget that they are at the end of the day only people who will express to others what Allah said in the holy book. We are not authorized to make a ruling in al-Islam. I cannot tell you this is halal or that is haram. But I am 
allowed to tell you Allah said this in the Quran about that and he said this about the Quran about that and you make up your own mind these are two different the sheikhs they took the seats of halal and haram now this is halal that is haram shaving the beard is haram uh, the womb doesn't cover her hair haram you do this haram you dress like that you eat this you do this you, haram, haram 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 that is not their job but hey 15 centuries of this halal and haram and all these things and we are nowhere. Allah, my dear sisters and my brothers, has taken a covenant from anyone who takes it upon himself or herself to preach al-Islam. Today, when you go on YouTube or you go, you hear all kinds of people talking about al-Islam. And I am sure if somebody else was talking about this very point and they have looked at me, they will say, oh, this one also talks about Islam. So I'm counted on that. But in general, people are all around and every, uh, sometimes I hear them and I cringe. Really? And I go, really? That, 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 that is not what Allah says. Yes, I leave comments in the messages and I move on. But the covenant that Allah took from the people who were granted knowledge is a very dangerous one. It's the same covenant that he took from other messengers, from Nuh, Ibrahim, Muhammad, Isa, Musa, and all these people. Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ اللَّهُ مِيثَاقَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابِ And Allah took a pledge, an oath, from those who were given the book. We are given the book, the Jews were given the book, Christians were given the book, the people of Noah and the people of Abraham and so on and so forth. Anyone who was given a book will fall under this law. So Allah took a pledge, an oath, from those who were given the book. What is this pledge? لَتُبَيِّنُنَّهُ لِلنَّاسِ وَلَا تَكْتُمُونَ You will make it known to people and you not cancel it. So that is the covenant. The covenant of every learned person is that when they open their mouth, it must be to express what Allah said in the Quran. Not their point of view and nothing else. Them. Relay what is inside the book. And Allah says, you will make it known to people and not conceal it. Conceal it. And the answer should have been yes. That's what I'm going to do. And that's what I aim and plan to do. I tell you what Allah says, what this ayah says, or what that ayah says, and up to you to do what with what I tell you. But I will not tell you my point of view is this. So, what does this man of religion do? However, they threw it violently. And nabth is when you throw something with violence. They, they threw it violently away behind their backs. I, the word of Allah got so uh, thrown away, so ignored, not in front of them, behind their, uh, their backs. And this is, you can clearly see it today. Oh, today the Palestinians are being killed by the Jews and we are in November 2023. Murdered, murdered. The Nazis are back on track. Today, the Jews today are being the Nazis. The sheikhs in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, none of them, when I say none of them, I mean those, the sheikhs in power, speaks against the Jews. They shut up. They're talking about the cattle fetal. They talk about if you fart, what you should do. Humans are being murdered. And this is where the problem is. Should they have followed the Quran, none of these sheikhs would have shut his mouth, at least his mouth. But because they are not, فَنَبَذُوهُ وَرَاءَ ظُهُورِهِمْ They violently threw it away behind their backs. وَاشْتَرَوْ بِهِ ثَمَنًا قَلِيلًا And instead of using the Qur'an as a means of guidance, they purchased with it a small price, a small return. The job they're doing, the, 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 the special status they get with the government and all these things. Of course, a sheikh will not speak because he'll be fired. And fired he will be, no source of income, that's it. And this is one of our big problems, is when the sheikhs make a living with Islam. And then Allah says, فَبِئْسَ مَا يَشْتَرُونَ How evil it is what they have purchased. And this is in Surah Ali Imran, Surah number 3, the Ayah 187. 
On Judgment Day, on Judgment Day when everyone is expecting, you see, every deed we do today, we do it with the purpose of, on Judgment Day we get a reward, right? So on Judgment Day, when everyone is expecting a reward from their actions, you will find a lot of people excited. Yay! Why are you excited? From Well, I followed the Sunnah of the Messenger. But on Judgment Day, the Sunnah of the Messenger is irrelevant. It has no value whatsoever. On Judgment Day, the only book that is going to be brought to the law, to the court of law, is the Quran. On Judgment Day, Allah knows this. I told you in Al-Quran, what did you do with it? That's it. And you, when you do a deed, you make, you, you better have an answer. Ya Allah, I did this because you said that. End of it. Allah doesn't want to know what Al-Bukhari said or what Muslim said or what Ibn Taymiyyah said or what Abdul Salam or whatever. It's you. You have chosen to be a Muslim. It's a duty. Your duty to ensure that you're acting according to the message sent to you. That message is the Quran. That's it. So on judgment day, the Quran shall be put. The book of law to which we will be held accountable for the Jews is the Torah. For the, the, each nation, their book. Fine. And then we will come. I will say this. Of course, more about this in other talks, but for now. On judgment day, Allah will hold us accountable to an atom weight of our deeds. Allah is not going to say, okay, I'll hold you accountable for the big deeds, small ones, that's ah, okay. No, 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 no. If your action has a weight of an atom, we will see it. Whoever does an atom weight of good will see it. You will see it in your book. Allah has stated in the Quran that Rasulullah, the angels that write of our actions, do not miss a single deed, even if it is to the atom weight. You <laughs> Sometimes you'll be walking, yeah, and uh, something catches your eyesight, and you look at it, you glance at it like a split of a second, right? On judgment day, we will see that split of a second right in front of us, and we do good. Split of a second, we will see it on judgment day. And then on judgment day, Allah will take that action and he will put it right in front of us. The people who don't believe in judgment day or who are taking it lightly now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in Surah Al-Kahf, the surah, the, the famous surah, where everybody reads it every Friday, expected words. All right? Allah speaks about humanity when one day it shall be gathered all on one single row, shoulder to a shoulder from the first human, Adam, not the first created human, but the first re religious, uh, i.e. a human who got a religion, starting by Adam to the last one, shoulder to a shoulder. All do ala rabbika saffan. Every single human, shoulder to shoulder, and the book of actions will be put. What will the people who did not expect good, who, who did not make their calculations right in regards to the day of judgment? Our, oh my God, oh, woe to us, misery, doom to us, loss, oh God. Why is this a book? Does not leave a small deed or a big deed except it has detailed it. On judgment day, the smallest of our actions is detailed in the book of deeds. And the biggest one, if we are all alone in a room, on a winter night when nothing moves and we are extremely cold and under those heavy blankets we are warm and and we are asleep and then you let loose a small the tiniest of fart nobody even your cat who is sleeping right at your butt can't even smell or hear that fart guess what the angels have already documented it <laughs> I'm just giving an idiot example, but that is what's going to happen. On, the, on that day, when we come to the deeds of action,
If Allah is going to show us the smallest, the weight, the atom weight of our deeds, do you think the Janazah Salat is going to go amiss? The first thing that the Messenger will do on Judgment Day is to wash his hands away from the Muslims. In other words, he's going to throw the entire nation of Muslims under the bus. وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رب, And the Messenger Muhammad would say on Judgment Day, يَا رَبْ O Lord, إِنَّ قَوْمِ My people to whom you sent me, the Arabs on the first degree, and then as the followers, اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا have left this Qur'an and deliberately abandoned it and ignored it. And this is in Surah Al-Furqan, Surah number 25, Ayah 30. And since you and I do not wish to be part of those people who would be accused on Judgment Day to have abandoned and forsaken and deliberately ignored the Qur'an, we need to see if al janaza proceedings today and the funerals, the Muslim pro, uh, funerals, are part of Allah's Islam or not. You see, there are certain actions that are not part of al Islam directly. But when we do them, we get rewarded for them. Because they are under the general ceiling or roof of whatever Allah wants. For example, Allah has said in Al-Quran that إِنَّ اللَّهُ يُحِبُّ التَّوَابِينَ وَيُحِبُّ الْمُتَطَهِرِينَ Allah loves those who come back to him after they have sinned and those who purify themselves, both physically and spiritually. Fine. So Allah loves it when we are clean. Okay. When we wake up in the morning after a night sleep, what do you do? The first thing, you go to the bathroom and you take care of your business. You go to the toilet, you empty your uh, stomach, you poo and you pee. Why? To get ready for whatever food you're going to take throughout the day. So you got to first empty the tank before filling it. Good. Then do what? Then you wash your hands. And then you wash your faces and uh, your face and you... Uh, make yourself look better, make good, and that's it. And you have a fresh face and you go and eat. We do that and we are not saying, oh, washing the face in the morning is part of an Islam. We don't say that. Because to us, washing the face in the morning, going to the toilet, are rituals that we do humans to look good, to feel good, to be good. This is, this is taking place around the earth. If anyone says, oh, washing the face in the morning is part of Islam because Allah said Allah loves those who clean themselves, you tell him, no, you're wrong. Allah didn't say in the morning. Allah spoke in general. When you take a weekly bath, that is part of you looking clean. When you change your clothing, that is part of you looking clean and being clean. When you are changing your underwear, that is part of that. So Allah will reward you, sure, because you're doing a deed that is under a general umbrella of cleanliness, but is not directly pointed at you. This is different than when Allah forbids, for example, fornication. Fornication is haram, end of it. When you have the possibility to fornicate and you don't go and fornicate, Allah rewards you. Why? Because you're following his instruction. Washing your face in the morning is not a direct instruction by Allah. But not fornicating, that's a direct instruction by Allah. So when I say, I am not fornicating because Allah made it haram, when judgment day comes and I see that, Allah will reward me. Why? Because it's in the Quran. It's a direct instruction. But all those times when I washed my face, but I didn't make them part of Islam, Allah will reward me because I'm looking good. But the moment I say washing your face is what Allah wants from you, I need to bring in evidence where Allah says washing the face is part of you. You see what I mean? And this is where Janazah comes in. Us and the other kingdoms around us, that is, humans, we exist on earth, but we're not alone. We've got animals. Animals have a life. They have a soul, they have a life. If you kill your dog out of viciousness for no reason, or you kill your kitten or cat just for the fun of it, 
On judgment day, Allah will hold you responsible. You killed a soul and you are not entitled to, you are not allowed to. Why did you kill it? But, 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 if you take care of an animal and you feed them and you are good to them, Allah will reward you. Why? Because the zoologist, the, the, the world of animals around us is exactly as we are. If you look at cats, the, the world of cats, you can rest assured in the realm of cats, in the kingdom of cats, cats resemble humans 100%. Yes, they don't speak English. Yes, they don't talk Italian. Yes, right? But guess what? If you have a German shepherd who grew up in Italy and is taught Italian, you know a dog can learn between 300 to 500 words. So you can teach your dog to hold the whole conversation. He'll understand the whole conversation if you teach him the meanings of the words like you would teach a toddler. All right? So let's assume we have a dog and we taught him 300 words. But these 300 words are in Italian. And we bring this, another German shepherd in French. And we in France, and we teach him 300 words of the French. We bring a third German dog, and we teach him English, and we teach him 300 words. The same 300 words that we taught the other dogs. And then we bring a fourth German shepherd in the Arab world, and we teach him 300 words, the same 300 words, like the ones in English, French, and Italian, and so on. And one, let's say the fifth one, is in India. Guess what? When we bring Indians or Arabs or Italians or French or English and they talk to the dog, each dog will understand the native language in which he was taught. It means animals are cut to understand our language should we teach it to them. And this is why Allah taught the language of animals to uh, Suleiman and his father Dawood. Allah taught it to them. Why? Because animals too, just like us, have different ways of conversing. We just need it to learn. Today, there are scientific researchers that are looking into understanding orcas, the whale killers, or the whales and the mammals who live at sea. Today, they say with the artificial intelligence and dedicated research plans, we will one day communicate with these animals because we will learn their language. And guess what? It already is happening. Why am I saying this to you? Because since Allah has made us not the only ones on earth, he made other animals to be exactly like humans. Allah has said in Al-Quran, وَمَا مِنْ دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا طَائِرٍ يَطِيرُ بِجَنَاحَيْهِ And there is not a living creature on land, i.e. any animal, nor a bird flying with its two wings in the skies. إِلَّا أُمَمٌ أَمْثَالُكُمْ Except they are but nations like you. In other terms, Animals are vicious like we are vicious. They love like we love. They hate like we hate. They Animals are just like us. It's us in the shape of animals. And then Allah says, مَا فَرَّطْنَا فِي الْكِتَابِ مِنْ شيء. We have not neglected anything in the book, i.e. the book of creation, the laws of creation. And then Allah establishes something that we, sadly people who don't listen to the Quran, have forgotten to learn. ثُمَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يُحْشَرُونَ Then to their Lord all these animals shall be gathered in front of Allah. Yes, the lion who killed the cubs of another lion just to assert his dominance in the new pride will be on judgment today called why he did that viciously. Allah did not put that in the instinct of lions. When they do it, they do it with viciousness. It's to hurt. Yes. So on judgment today, Allah will bring that lion and he will ask him, in a manner, why did you do that? Animals are. And this one is in Surah Al-An'am, that is Surah number 6, the Ayah 38. Since animals are like us, and we humans, when we lose somebody, we grieve over our loss. Well, it has been found out 
by the wildlife biologists and all these zoologists, scholars and these researchers, they find out that some mammals also express grief when one of theirs die. Sometimes when you watch these uh, videos on YouTube about animals in the jungle, you find that, for example, lions attack an animal and they want to eat a gazelle. And the moment they want to do that, and you find other gazelles attacking the lion to free their brother, their sister, the, the other animal from the claws of that animal. So now we understand that the other animals know exactly what's happening. They know that the lions are going to kill the one of theirs and they need to defend it. And guess what? Oftentimes they succeed. And uh, that means just like us humans, if you see someone beating up on a child or on a woman or someone who's weak or two people fighting, what do we do? We intervene. We want to stop that. So these people found out that there are some animals that have some complex death rituals. Animals. I'm not talking about humans. Animals. Of these animals, elephants. Crows, the birds, the crow, they bury their dead. Chimpanzees, dolphins, giraffes, orcas. And I can, I, I, the list can go on, but it's enough that I mentioned these guys. Animals aren't deprived of emotions. Each kind, each breed, and each category resembles the human in our foundation, in our basic acts. We love they express love. Yes, they do express it differently. My cat loves me. He comes and expresses his love to me. He's not going to bring me flowers. So, instead of bringing me flowers, my animal will bring me a dead rat. He kills a rat and brings it to share it with me. Why? Because in the kingdom of cats, sharing your food is a great deed. So, he shares it with me, thinking, okay, the human is like me. And me, I get grossed. I throw the animal away, the dead animal. But guess what? To the cat... He's expressed his love to me. When my cat bites my hand and scratches me, it, it's painful to me. But to him, it's not. To him, it's expressing closeness. He's close to me. He's playing with me. The friendly bites, <laughs> yes, they make me put disinfectant on my wound. But to the cat, oh, I had a good time with my fellow human. We had an awesome time. We played. But my hand is aching. So we express love and being close, different. We all have fear. We deal with it differently, but it's there. We say the female are weak, yeah? But try to hurt the baby of a mother. She'll eat your life. And I have seen chicken fighting cobras just because the cobra wanted to hurt the baby chicken. And so the chicken are not scared. It's just that times they don't want war. They, they, but if you corner them, they will turn into deadly animal. So from this area, we understand that animals do feel pain. When they lose one of theirs, they also feel and cry and feel grief and are hurt, all these things. Have you ever seen a, a mother who loses one of her kittens, how she behaves at home? She loses her heart. She's crying, meow, meow, here and there. I've seen it. It broke my heart. She gave birth, four, and then one or two died. I don't remember the exact number, so I had to throw them over. They died. When the mother came, she lost her mind, and she kept turning around me, and all that kind of stuff. And I felt bad, really felt bad for the cat. And then I took her to the garden where I had put her babies, and there I put her right in front of them. She smelled them, and I left her with them. And then when she came back later on, she did not erratically behave like she did. She calmed down. And I understood that she understood that her babies have dies, have died. So all the living animals, from the biggest of them, or the elephant, the giraffe, to the smallest, tiniest bacteria, all of them express grief when they lose one of theirs. It's just at times you do not understand what it is that they are feeling. But they do feel it. And this is a truth that Allah has delivered to us in the Quran. One day, when Musa went to see Fir'aun, in a conversation between the two, remember Fir'aun had claimed that he is God, he is the Lord. I am your highest God. 
So worship me. So when Musa went to the Pharaoh in the castle, the Pharaoh has had, had his audience, the people around him, the minister, all these people. So when Musa came in and showed him the hand and showed him the snake and did this, Pharaoh felt embarrassed. Here is Musa claiming from the children of Israel. And Musa is there addressing Pharaoh. The Pharaoh is there listening and conversing with Musa. And uh, Pharaoh felt, as I said, embarrassed by the statement of Musa. So to Pharaoh tried not to get back at Musa in front of the audience because people are going to talk. And they go, so Pharaoh asks Musa, فَمَنْ رَبُّكُمَا يَا مُوسَى Who is your Lord, you two? Musa and his brother, Harun, Aaron. Pharaoh asks him, and who is your Lord, you two? Oh, Musa, come on. Musa said, رَبُّنَا our Lord, الَّذِي أَعْطَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلْقَهُ is the one who has given everything its design. A snake is the way it is because Allah wanted him like that. A python the big, huge uh, snakes are the way they are because Allah wanted them like that. A lion, Allah designed him like that. A tiger and so on and so forth, just like he designed you and me. So Musa tells him, Our Lord is the one who has given everything its design. I.e. including you, your Pharaoh, and you have, <laughs> your Pharaoh can design nothing. You can't design a butterfly, you can't design anything like that. And then Musa added an extremely important term, thummahada. And then, after Allah gave us our shape and forms and everything, He inspired us. And that is what we call the life instinct. To lead a life according to a particular behavioral code to ensure life. When, when a shark wants to mate another shark, the female shark, they have their courting rituals dedicated to sharks when we go to the whales they have theirs we go to the lions they have theirs we go to dogs they have the theirs and when you go to humans they have theirs so each of Allah's creation has been given its shape and how we interact and how we live our lives part of that part of this uh, what Allah inspired in us the life instinct is how we deal with somebody when they die we express it animals express it birds express it orcas express it snakes express it everyone expresses a loss in a way or another and from here comes the question why do we bury when we lose somebody why do we bury them? I will stop here and we'll inshallah carry on on part two of this Janaza matter. Assalamu alaikum.